Uh, this is a this project is work in progress uh, and it's joint work with Richard Parnham and Mari Sarko, uh, both of whom I think are um, in the uh, uh, workshop today. Uh, and it's work that's being done as part of a large grant uh, that we've received uh, from UKRI uh, to uh, look at the uh, impact of AI on legal services. The project name is called Unlocking the Potential of AI for English Law. Uh, and we're working in this part of it uh, on one of six work packages in the wider uh, project, um, which encompass uh, computer science projects, education projects, pedagogy, um, economics, uh, and uh, legal and normative issues, uh, and uh, the uh, state of the job market in uh, legal services in relation to technology. So the piece we're looking at is the impact on, on uh, business models uh, in legal services and their relationship uh, with the governance of law firms. So this is, this is as I said, work, work in progress. We're really looking forward to getting your comments and uh, feedback. So um, just to introduce uh, what we're doing, um, the motivation for the project is uh, how will new technologies such as AI reshape the work of lawyers and the legal profession? And there are and have been for a long time, a wide divergence of views on this. So Richard Susskind uh, is probably the best known uh, advocate of what we might call a, a transformation thesis. Uh, so he has been claiming for many years that uh, AI and other technologies will transform uh, legal services. So here's a quote from him. There's no obvious reason uh, that many of today's professionals won't be displaced by increasingly capable systems and then fade from prominence much as blacksmiths, tallow chandlers, mercers, and many trades became redundant in their day. So if correct, that's not good news uh, for lawyers, and it's certainly not good news for those of us who teach lawyers in the law faculty. Um, in contrast, there is a, uh, uh, an equally uh, vocal uh, uh, perspective um, from uh, a more conservative position who argue that actually uh, it's not possible that what lawyers do uh, will ever be replaced by technology. Uh, and this is the will continue as normal school. Uh, so if Richard Susskind stands for complete transformation, the continuance as normal school suggests that lawyers will just carry on doing what they do uh, uh, because they're in some way unique and, 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 and uh, will not capable of being uh, replaced by technology. Uh, and an example of this from a recent paper by Remus and Levy, uh, who, who note that even where automation has made significant progress, its impact has been less than the headlines would have us believe. Uh, so uh, suggesting that, the, that there's been a lot of hype about uh, AI uh, in the sector. So our research project is mixed methods. Uh, so we've done uh, qualitative empirical work. We've conducted over 50 uh, semi-structured interviews with professionals uh, involved in implementing or overseeing the implementation of AI in legal services firms uh, in the UK. Uh, we started in January 2019 and we're still uh, completing those interviews. And we've grouped these around, uh, we've done some scoping interviews, but we've also uh, grouped most of these around 12 organizational case studies. Uh, which include law firms, corporate clients, uh, that is uh, in-house teams in, in large corporates, uh, and uh, some alternative legal service providers, which is a new and heterogeneous category uh, in the marketplace. This includes law tech startups, alternative business structures, uh, the big four, uh, and uh, some new entrants, uh, which are corporations, companies, uh, that provide legal services uh, that style themselves as law companies. So the idea with the, uh, uh, the, the case studies is that we uh, interview multiple people in the same organization and then that way uh, we get a robust cross-section of what's going on so we triangulate the perspective by asking uh, multiple people uh, about how um, how, how uh, things are done um, and then we also have a quanti uh, set of quantitative data so we conducted uh, an anonymous survey of practicing solicitors in England and Wales uh, which we ran in conjunction with the Law Society uh, and this uh, this survey was live in December of last year through to January this year um, it was distributed to over 10,000 lawyers. Um, the response rate with these sorts of things is very low. We only got about three and a half percent. So we've ended up with uh, 350 odd uh, valid responses. But we're able to say something uh, interesting, I hope, uh, with those responses. Uh, so what we do with mixed methods is we use the qualitative work uh, to help, uh, first of all, uh, inform uh, the development of hypotheses. Uh, and secondly, uh, to provide some causal insights uh, in relation to the processes that are going on uh, in the data that we're looking at. Uh, and then we use the quantitative uh, uh, data to try to uh, look for um, uh, more aggregate level relationships uh, in uh, the variables that we're studying. 
So an overview of uh, today's presentation. Uh, I'm going to start by uh, giving uh, a, a descriptive account of how AI gets used in legal services. Uh, and we'll see that both um, at the aggregate level uh, and then also some uh, particular use cases. So we'll see uh, what, you know, what context actually is AI being used. And I'll say a little bit about what we mean by AI as well. Uh, then uh, we'll go on to look at the, the, the uh, mechanics of deployment. So, so what, do, what does it actually look like to deploy AI? So rather than thinking about where it fits into the business of the, of the organization, how do we get the personnel together uh, and how does that relate to the uh, type of organization uh, that we're looking at? Uh, and that part will include uh, some qualitative uh, empirical results. So we'll look at some case studies uh, from the qualitative work. Then in part four, uh, we'll move on to the quantitative results. We'll review a multivariate analysis of the survey data uh, part five, we will uh, explore the implications of this analysis for law firms and the legal profession. And finally, I'll conclude. So let's go then to uh, looking at uh, AI uh, in legal services uh, in section two. Uh, so what I'm, what I'm doing here is giving an overview of how AI is being used uh, in, the, uh, in the marketplace. Um, and I want to begin this by uh, framing the deployment of AI against a wider literature uh, uh, about the future of work. Uh, and in this sense, we can think about how uh, what's happening in the legal sector uh, has, uh, uh, um, uh, resonates with what's happening uh, with the deployment of AI more generally uh, in many, many other sectors. Uh, so the economic literature on the future of work uh, posits that the introduction of a new technology has two uh, effects. There's a substitution effect uh, where uh, technology replaces humans in some tasks. Uh, and then there's a, a, a complementing effect. Uh, so uh, for humans uh, whose tasks or performing tasks that are not replaced, the technology may augment them. Uh, so it may complement what they're doing, uh, enable them to perform more effectively. So the impact of the introduction of a new technology on workers or firms uh, depends on whether what they're doing is substitutable or whether it's uh, a complement, a uh, complementary to the new technology. So if your, uh, if your work is something that can be substituted for by technology, uh, like the Mercers uh, and the Tallow uh, manufacturers that Richard uh, Susskind speaks of, uh, then your uh, human capital goes down when a new technology, the value of your human capital goes down when a new technology is introduced. But if uh, what you're doing uh, if the new technology enables you to do what you do more effectively, then uh, in the short run at least, uh, the value of your human capital goes up uh, when that technology uh, is introduced because it allows you to do more of, of that uh, which it is uh, uh, your capital is valuable for. So which is which uh, in the context of um, uh, legal services? Which, which tasks can be substituted for uh, and which tasks uh, are complements? Uh, so the general literature um, has changed its perspective on this uh, over the last uh, 15 years or so. Uh, and that is a result of technological change. So in the early 2000s, uh, it was thought that the distinction between tasks that could be substituted by technology and tasks that could not, uh, depended on whether the tasks were routine or, or non-routine. Uh, so uh, there's a quote there from Autor and co-authors 2003, uh, pointing out that uh, at that time, navigating a car through city traffic or deciphering the scrawled handwriting on a personal check, uh, which are uh, minor undertakings for most adults, are not routine tasks uh, as understood uh, in the literature at that time. These tasks require visual and motor processing capabilities that can't at present be described in terms of a set of programmable rules. And so the characterization of routine um, at the turn of the century uh, was very much in terms of setting out rules uh, that could then be followed by an automated system. Now, what's happened with the technology uh, underpinning AI uh, since then, what's happened in the last uh, 15 years or so, is a revolution uh, in the, the, the way in which problems are solved by the technology. Uh, so rather than uh, now being approached from a top-down uh, rule-based approach, where we have to write a set of rules to solve the problem, um, rather we can uh, take a lot of data and then have an algorithm search in that data for the aspects of the data that are most co closely correlated with something that we're looking to find. 
If we provide it with a set of examples where we've identified what it is that we're looking for, um, we can then uh, allow the system, a machine learning system, to find the other aspects of the data that are most closely related with the thing that we're looking for. Um, so we don't need to provide rules in advance, we just need to provide it with some examples of what we're interested in, uh, and then the system figures out uh, what the, uh, uh, the most useful uh, or, the, or the best predictive relationships are. And this means that things that previously uh, would have been impossible for a rule-based system, uh, like navigating a car through city traffic or deciphering a personal check, these can now be automated. Uh, and uh, you know, many of us have used the apps that um, banks provide now to allow us to pay checks in remotely. Uh, and um, uh, we, we all know about um, autonomous vehicles uh, and, and what they're capable of doing. Uh, and so these, these reflect advances uh, in the technology uh, through the use of machine learning. However, machine learning has not made every task capable of being automated. So uh, it works best for tasks where you have a lot of data of previous examples. So you need that, that, that body of previous examples that you can show to the system from which it can then be trained to uh, figure out what the relationships are in the data. Uh, so it doesn't work well uh, for tasks where we are creating a solution to a problem for the first time. So for a truly customized or truly bespoke task, uh, then machine learning doesn't work well because we don't have any prior examples that we can use to train the system. Similarly, um, it's, not, uh, uh, it's not proved uh, easy to uh, gather data on uh, the many uh, uh, rich and varied cues, uh, verbal and nonverbal, that go into uh, social interactions. Uh, and so tasks that involve uh, social intelligence, that is reading the cues of people's faces and understanding uh, the likely reaction in a particular context to what something is said, uh, that too continues to elude uh, machine learning systems. So Frey and Osborne, two uh, scholars in Oxford University, uh, wrote a very, very influential paper a few years ago uh, where they tried to identify uh, using uh, uh, the machine learning technology, what kind of tasks could be automated and what would not. Uh, and they drew the boundary um, uh, between those that require uh, creative intelligence or social intelligence and those that don't. So let's take this general literature on the future of work and bring it back to legal services and see how uh, does this apply. Uh, so on the one hand, um, there is some work uh, which is capable of being substituted. Uh, that is capable of uh, being done by a machine learning system. So this is work that is repetitive. That is that there are lots of uh, prior examples that we can use to train the system. Uh, uh, it's text-based uh, and uh, things that uh, can be scaled uh, rapidly uh, in uh, where, where there are many, many uh, future instances where we want to do something similar. Now, at the same time, there are lots of things that lawyers do um, or like to think they do um, that are outside the boundary of what is technically possible uh, using uh, current machine learning uh, techniques. Uh, and so things that require creative and social intelligence, uh, so creative intelligence is needed for doing uh, work of a, a unique kind or truly bespoke mm. work that is unique to a particular client uh, or a, a, a matter which has a unique characteristics. Um, there won't be prior examples that we can use to train AI here. Um, and work that involves giving uh, client advice or interacting with the client requires a mastery of social intelligence uh, in order to uh, make that work. So uh, we might conclude from this that actually much of lawyering um, is going to be insulated, at least from the current um, uh, implementation of AI, uh, because of these characteristics. Uh, and actually, uh, lawyers who are able to harness AI to do the stuff uh, that previously might have taken lots of person hours, uh, but now can be done rapidly by a machine, their productivity will be complemented enormously uh, by this technical uh, revolution. However, how big is that set of truly uh, bespoke work uh, that lawyers do. Uh, and so there is a boundary here uh, where uh, work where there are uh, prior examples will be pushing uh, against uh, the uh, work that uh, uh, can be done by uh, humans. At the same time, uh, there is another uh, set of human roles which are created by the application of the new technology. So just as mechanization in the Industrial Revolution led to the 
mechanization. You know, some people were put out of work, some people had their tasks substituted, um, but mechanization led to the creation of all sorts of new roles in the production of machinery and the operation of machinery. There are many uh, new roles created to make these technical systems work in the context of uh, legal services. So these new roles are also complements to the technology. That is the technology, the application of the technical system uh, will not function uh, without the uh, human capital contained uh, in these new roles. So to take the title of the project, Augmented Lawyering, um, we can understand the impact of AI or the, the advent of AI for legal services as involving augmentation of roles in two senses. Uh, so one sense is the traditional uh, bespoke or client advisory work of, of a lawyer uh, uh, that, that we all think of um, when, when we start law school. Um, this role, uh, this kind of work is augmented by these technical systems. But at the same time, there is legal human capital, so a deep understanding of the, um, of the domain of legal services, which goes into the new roles needed to make the technical systems work. So these new roles are themselves augmenting the technology. Uh, so there is augmentation or complementarity between these new roles and the technology, just as there is complementarity between the technology and the traditional roles. And so what we are interested in is understanding the relationship of these new roles, these new human roles, and this technical capital here with the traditional uh, lawyer roles uh, within organizations and within the profession as a whole. So um, that was quite abstract. I think it will uh, be helpful to give some discrete examples of use cases at a more micro level. Uh, these are derived out of some of our case studies. Um, and we can see the particular context in which AI is being used in law. Um, so an overview first from our survey, uh, these are the results um, uh, of the uh, types of, uh, or the, 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 the rate of uh, deployment of AI assisted legal technology uh, and the um, uh, types of context in which it's used. Uh, and the first point to note is that the penetration of this technology in the sector as a whole is relatively modest. So these percentages are in many cases are barely into double digits. This is a random survey, or this is a survey that's sent out uh, to uh, 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 practicing solicitors from large and small firms, so up and down the country. Uh, and uh, we, we um, therefore, uh, it gives a, a reasonably, uh, it, gives, it gives a picture that is not, not um, uh, subject to the sort of uh, self-selection bias that we get when we do interviews, because when we do interviews, we tend to find that only the people uh, who feel that they've had a successful experience with AI want to talk to us. Uh, so people who have nothing to say about AI say, well, we're not interested in uh, doing an interview with you. Um, but this suggests that the, the penetration is relatively low, um, but it does give some clue as to the kinds of contexts uh, in which uh, it's used. So legal research, due diligence, e-discovery, regulatory compliance, contract analytics, uh, predictive billing uh, uh, are some of the uh, main uh, uh, use cases. And I'll, 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 I'll shed a little bit more light on this. I'll break out uh, uh, these uh, uh, a little bit more. So, so one, uh, one context in which is used is in contracts. So uh, so-called contract analytics is where um, an organization that uh, is uh, entering into lots and lots of contracts of a similar kind on a regular basis, it could be a financial institution, it could be a large corporate, um, they uh, will you know, try to originate some of those contracts themselves, but they'll often be subject to contracts coming from other parties that are sent to them for, for review. And that review is time consuming. And the organization will develop a playbook of certain kinds of clauses that they're willing to agree to uh, and certain kinds of clauses that they're not. Um, but the exact wording of the clause, the exact way that it's framed may vary depending on who's drafted the contract. Um, so uh, contract analytics platforms, uh, which are examples of which are Thought River and, and, and Raven, um, they uh, allow a user to train a system to integrate the rule book that they have uh, to be able to automatically review incoming contracts and identify clauses that the organization doesn't like. A similar, a similar kind of thing is going on in a due diligence context. In a due diligence, we've got a firm being acquired um, uh, by another firm. So this is not a, not a business as usual transaction, it's an out of the ordinary transaction. Uh, but in this kind of context, 
the acquirer is uh, usually uh, wanting to review the entire corpus of contracts of the firm that's being acquired to see if there's anything in there uh, that might leave them uh, with an unpleasant surprise afterwards, for example, a change of control clause. Uh, and again, uh, uh, AI platforms are being used, uh, are being trained to identify these kinds of clauses uh, and then uh, reduce the amount of time required uh, to do that. Uh, so I got a, uh, 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 a question in, in chat from Luca. John, how do we know uh, whether interviewees know whether the software they use is AI enhanced uh, for legal research? Um, we gave them uh, a definition of AI, which is uh, essentially uh, that it is something that um, uh, is, is going to be uh, uh, an automation of something for which humans would ordinarily uh, use their brains. Um, okay, so then the next, uh, the next uh, use case um, that I just want to highlight is uh, in the context of disputes. And there are two types of, uh, of use case here. One that's been around for a long time, so that started uh, you know, maybe 15 years or, ago, uh, is uh, e-discovery or, or, or um, predictive coding, where in the context of trying to identify material that's relevant as part of a discovery uh, exercise, material that's relevant from a vast mass of data, um, now it's common to train uh, an AI system with um, uh, uh, features, uh, uh, with some documents that are uh, relevant to the uh, features of the particular case, uh, and then set that system running uh, on uh, the uh, large body of electronic information. Um, and that's now uh, very widely used um, in the contentious matter context. Then the other thing that is starting to come on stream, but is uh, much more, uh, has, has so far achieved a much lower level of penetration is so-called litigation analytics, where uh, what uh, is, is happening is, is the uh, system is trying to predict the outcome of a dispute uh, based on the facts and prior precedents. So the inputs here are prior precedents, prior facts, uh, and then it tries to predict the outcome of a dispute. Um, and this is this is uh, started to be used in the US and is, is, is beginning uh, to emerge uh, in the UK. Then um, if we move away from the practice of law, another context in which uh, firms are using AI is in what they call the business of law. So managing the business of the law firm. Uh, and in particular, uh, in figuring out how much to charge for a matter in advance. So notoriously, uh, legal services are billed by the hour um, and the client is given an estimate, but it may or may not be uh, uh, the end up being the actual amount that uh, the actual amount of time that's required to complete it. Um, well, predictive billing, uh, uh, uses AI to analyze past timesheet data to then figure out uh, a, a more accurate prediction of how much time will be required to do a matter of a particular kind. Similarly, this kind of uh, technique can also be used to manage capacity, the utilization of professionals, make sure that they're uh, working effectively uh, to capacity. So all of, these, uh, all of these kinds of applications are being used uh, in the sector. It's not a, a majority pursuit, as we saw, it's a relatively low penetration across the sector as a whole, but it's growing. So what I want to do now, finally, in this piece about the this description about the uh, deployment is to highlight the multidisciplinarity uh, of uh, a team that are involved in uh, actually implementing an AI pipeline. Um, so uh, the, way, uh, the way to think about this in, in terms of, the, con in terms of the, the slide I put up before is uh, the people who are in this new role, these new roles that are making the system work, um, uh, what sort of what sort of people are required here, uh, and how do they fit together, and what level of integration do they have um, with the traditional lawyers uh, who might be using uh, the output of the system? So uh, this is a, a, a schematic attempt to um, uh, capture a pipeline uh, for a process uh, 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 of the application of AI. So first of all, uh, we need. Uh, some technical know-how to design and test the uh, technical system uh, that will be used to uh, deliver answers in the context, say, of contract analytics or in the context of e-discovery. Then once the system has been uh, designed, we need to train it. We need to give it uh, data. And so the data has to be uh, checked to ensure that it is, uh, has appropriate integrity uh, and that it is securely stored um, for the system to be able to analyze it, then uh, the uh, uh, data or some part of the data, uh, the, training, the training set has to be labeled or annotated um, according to the things 
that the um, user is interested in. So if we take the example of a due diligence uh, context in an M&A transaction, let's say we want to find a uh, change of control clauses, um, the data that we will put in will be all the contracts of the acquirer, uh, and we need to make sure that this data is in a form that can be read by the system. Uh, we need to make sure it's not corrupted in any way. Um, and then um, the labeling or annotation will be that we'll take a subset of this data, the training set, and we will have a team of experts who understand what is a change of control clause and understand the ways in which these can be uh, written, who will then identify or flag or annotate uh, the training set according to whether or not there is a change of control present of a sort that is uh, relevant for the exercise. Um, so that will require um, legal expertise uh, in the uh, 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 question of what, is, what exactly is being looked for. Then the system, once it's trained, can be uh, set to work on uh, actually finding stuff, on actually making decisions. The output of the system, though, will then uh, require some interpretation, explanation, uh, and be then passed on to the client uh, in the way of advice. So uh, what's going on here is a mixture of different types of human capital uh, and technical capital are involved. So um, at the beginning, designing the product, we need some legal insight to understand the nature of the legal problems uh, that are going to be resolved. But we also need a lot of uh, computer science input, data science input to uh, set up the uh, system. Then um, on the ingestion of data, this is a task where the, just the sheer volume of the data uh, and issues around security of that data and making sure it's, uh, that it is in, in the right form to be readable, these are, the, these are things that come to the fore. So this is more of a project management challenge uh, and maybe infosec. Um, uh, uh, capability that's required there. Then in the labeling and annotation, we require some legal input, but we also need project management skills because this is a pipeline. We've got to get a throughput of these uh, cases to be labeled as quickly as possible. So we need uh, some, some project management capability uh, around this, uh, managing the relationship between the legal skill and the data. This part here, the application decision, that's fully automated. That's the bit that the machine does by itself, doesn't require any human input. Um, and then we get to this part, we need some data science input to understand uh, what the uh, confidence intervals are, are around the uh, results that come out to understand how to interpret it safely. And then we need some legal expertise to understand how to put this into the context of the legal issue that's being consulted on, and then to advise the client about the output. So what we see then to, uh, to, to sort of zoom back to the previous slide is a mix of automation, traditional legal uh, capital and uh, the traditional legal uh, legal advisory work and some new roles. So here, the traditional legal advisory work is in this box only at the end of the process. So the, the lawyer here will be advising the client based on the outcome of this technical process. But we also see legal human capital of a being used in a way that we wouldn't previously have thought of when we thought about lawyering. We see it being used to label documents uh, in the pipeline. We see it being used to help design and test a, pro a product. Um, so that's a different type of deployment of legal human capital. We're also seeing non-legal human capital uh, as key inputs to a number of stages of this process and also to the interpretation of the explanation. Um, and so the, the substitution piece is, uh, is only one part of this. What we're seeing um, is that the box of the, the lawyers who, as it were, who are unaffected uh, by the change, that's just this box here, this relatively small part of the process. Um, and then there will be some people using legal skills at other, other parts of the process and some people um, who are working here uh, as non-lawyers. Uh, non now, that that gives us a sense that what, to make this work effectively, what we need is a team uh, and a team that is multidisciplinary, bringing together people with legal expertise and people who don't have legal expertise, knitting them together to work effectively to provide the human capital that is essential to make the automation work. So a couple of perspectives here from scoping interviews that um, are, are, are relevant to this. So one of our interviewees in a law firm, and I should say, by the way, all the quotes that we're putting up today are from law firm interviewees. We did interview lots of people from other organizations as well, um, but we are working through 
uh, because we haven't quite finished the uh, interviews yet, we're still working through analyzing the interview data uh, with Envivo, uh, and we've got further with the law firm interviews than with the others. So I'm gonna put quotes up from the law firm. That doesn't mean that we won't have quotes subsequently uh, from the uh, non-law firm interviewee. So one law firm interviewee said to us, the new business units uh, in legal service, uh, uh, the new business units in legal services business are gonna have to look a lot more like business units in other mon modern non-legal businesses that combine the skills that are truly vocational, in other words, the lawyer, of which you need fewer and fewer, I think, over time, that combines those skills with a raft of other skills, including process skills, service transition skills, management information skills, and service management skills. So the claim there is that uh, what's going on in these uh, technology-enabled uh, parts of legal services uh, organizations is gonna have to look a lot more like technology-enabled uh, work in, uh, in, in other businesses, which are uh, much more multidisciplinary uh, in their organization. Another, another uh, interview, we made a similar point. I think that the death of the lawyer as an advisor is overstated or prematurely predicted. So as I've said, the lawyer as advisor is still part of this story. They're still there at the end of this technical process. But in a managed service unit, uh, you're gonna see a much different blend of people who are qualified lawyers, other types of fee earners, and a whole range of people used to delivering business processes efficiently that you'd recognize if you walked into any pharmaceuticals company, say, or retailer. If you went into a retailer in the buying department, you wouldn't just find buyers, you'd find a load of people who know how to run a buying function. Whereas in our real estate department, you've just got real estate lawyers. So the point there being that, the, uh, uh, that, 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 we, that we need this uh, multidisciplinary uh, uh, um, a group of uh, human capital in order to uh, make these processes function effectively. So this leads us to develop our first hypothesis, which is that the, the successful deployment of AI-based law tech is associated with the assembly of multidisciplinary teams. That is teams, personnel that involves uh, 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 disciplinary inputs other than uh, legal services. Let's now move on to um, look at the relationship between AI deployment and organizational form. I'm going to begin again here with a little bit of theory. Uh, and so this theory uh, is a straightforward application uh, of the uh, law and economics of business organizations. Uh, and so a partnership um, is owned by the partners. And so a, a law firm partnership, the partners are, um, are, are lawyers. Um, and this is a, a traditional partnership. So uh, we, we are uh, not dealing, we're not speaking here about alternative business structures, which since 2007 have been enabled in the UK, multi uh, partnerships uh, involving non-lawyer partners. Um, or uh, other, other forms of, uh, uh, of ownership. So we're looking at traditional uh, professional partnerships. So in the legal context, the, the partners will be the owners. Um, and the fact that the partners are the owners makes for uh, a desire for the partners to be involved uh, in, de in, in decision making. So we end up with decentralized consensus-based decision making. Um, now this model, um, Henry Hansman famously uh, pointed out why this model works well uh, for law firms. Uh, because legal services work traditionally uh, is something that requires a great deal of expertise to um, assess performance. Uh, and so having the owners uh, be the uh, senior managers um, means that there is strong incentives for oversight. Uh, and also there's no need to raise outside capital. Uh, there's a human capital intensive business. Uh, and if we have that relatively homogeneous group of, uh, of personnel, uh, all of whom are coming from a, a legal services background, then there's a clear uh, 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 a career path for people. They come in as junior lawyers and they may expect to be promoted to a partnership if they're successful. Uh, so recruitment and retention and motivation is handled by the prospect of having a partnership at the end of the career. Um, and these firms, because they're human capital intensive, typically don't need to raise much outside finance. Uh, partnership form doesn't lend itself to raising outside equity because the owners have to be uh, the partners. We contrast that with a corporate form. Uh, decision making uh, is more centralized. Ownership uh, is outside, can be outside investors and employees. It can be some mix of the two. Um, and this, as Larry Ribstein famously pointed out, um, permits uh, recruitment, retention, and motivation of multidisciplinary teams more effectively uh, than a homogeneous partnership of lawyers uh, because we can, a, a corporation can offer equity uh, in the firm. Uh, as uh, part of the uh, compensation package uh, and can offer a more uh, varied um, uh, promotion track uh, than just partner, non-partner. Uh, uh, and so that may work better uh, as, a, as an organizational structure for embedding multidisciplinary teams. They're also um, better able uh, to raise outside capital uh, in the form of equity. Uh, so I've got a couple of questions. Um, let me just uh, take these. Uh, so 
um, course. The applications you discuss are pretty specific. Is there a software platform that could be the basis for all these applications in a law firm? Uh, next to this, how do you manage the interfaces of various applications? So um, there isn't yet uh, a single platform uh, that can provide all of these use cases. Uh, and uh, making that, uh, you know, establishing connectivity uh, uh, across everything, um, that is a, 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 an important challenge for adoption. Uh, so people speak about uh, the proliferation of what they call point solutions. So a solution to a particular problem, uh, and then that, that comes with it uh, challenges of interoperability uh, with other parts of the uh, technology architecture. So we're still at early days uh, in terms of dealing with those sorts of issues. Um, Vaslav, do law firms prefer in-house multidisciplinary teams or hiring an external vendor? I'm going to, I hope, um, say, speak to that uh, in the uh, remainder of this section. Uh, and so uh, come back to me uh, if, if I haven't uh, satisfied you with the answer. So, so theory would suggest, uh, the standard, standard theory um, about uh, the organizational form would suggest that the uh, corporate form might be better adapted uh, for multidisciplinary teams. And we see some support for this uh, from our interviewees and case studies. Uh, so here's a perspective of a law firm interviewee uh, who said, we're obviously a very good firm with a good brand name associated, but in terms of access to young talent in the software space, they normally don't want to go and join a traditional law firm. They want to go and work for a cool software company. Uh, so, so working at a law firm is uh, not uh, uh, perceived as a great career destination uh, for those with uh, computer science or technical data science skills uh, because the question is, well, what is the career progression? Where do you go? Uh, uh, and where will you take that experience uh, from, uh, from uh, uh, that, 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 that you're gaining? Um, okay, so I have a question, um, Tom. Have cost-benefit analysis been carried out across the different applications? Uh, what are the applications where the value proposition is, is strongest and weakest? So yes, it is, it is clearly costly uh, to set up one of these pipelines. So Tom's question suggests that the, uh, the pipeline is costly. So yes, it's clearly costly. And one of the big things that, one of the other big things that come out of this is that there are significant fixed costs to establishing an AI pipeline. Uh, so uh, this, will, this will work or this will be deployed where the activity in question is capable of being scaled. Uh, so is it something that can be scaled? That's the key question, the key business question that's being asked before deployment. Uh, so if you take the training of a model with um, uh, uh, expertise about um, change of control clauses, um, one would hope that that could be scaled across multiple M&A transactions. Uh, and, and the size of the uh, uh, amount of or the, the amount of data that goes into a typical um, due diligence exercise is so vast um, that it's worth incurring significant startups in order to be able to yield the benefit uh, in that part of the uh, uh, in that part of the process that is automated. Because if that wasn't automated, it would have to be done by humans, uh, and 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 to get um, to get humans to do that at that scale is enormously costly. Uh, so yes, it is, is clearly costly to set up one of these pipelines, um, but in the context in which it is being used, uh, and those uh, the, the main ones are the ones that I flagged uh, in the use cases that I touched on, um, those are cases where those startup costs are worth incurring uh, because the costs of having humans do it um, are an order of magnitude uh, higher. Um, using software and due diligence requires us to have confidence in the software, which also needs to be assessed and hedged against. Absolutely. Uh, and so there needs to be a lot of testing uh, of the system before it's deployed. Uh, and there also needs to be a lot of careful interpretation. Um, and so um, that's all taken in. That's all part of the mix. So I've, I've glossed over you know, uh, some of these details to try to bring out the issues that are, are central to our inquiry. But yes, that is all, that is all uh, part of the mix. So um, another, another one of our law firm interviewees uh, made the following observation. I think it's gonna have to change the distinction between fee earners and non fee earners, because I think people in pure technology roles who've never qualified as a lawyer, but working on a solution that helps deliver a matter are contributing to the revenue of the firm directly. Um, so this is a perspective of somebody in a law firm who's saying that there should be more recognition given to the contributions of the firm of people who are 
coming from a non-law background, that is who are, who are not legally qualified, but are bringing technology skills to the mix uh, in a multidisciplinary team. So let's look at a, 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 some case studies just to see how uh, these, uh, 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 th these mixes of human capital break down uh, in uh, different organization types uh, that, we've, uh, that we've looked at. So one case study, uh, we'll call that law firm A, uh, they deploy AI in due diligence for M&A transactions. They license an AI platform from a vendor, so they, they license the software from the vendor. This minimizes the capital costs that are required because they don't need to, they don't need to buy the platform outright, they don't, need to develop, they don't need to invest in developing the platform themselves, uh, they license it from a vendor. The um, law firm A's personnel train the models, so they provide the legal human capital, the expertise in identifying the uh, clauses uh, that are uh, of interest. Um, the non-legal human capital for the multidisciplinary team is largely sourced from outside the organization. Uh, so the vendors people uh, will provide assistance uh, in thinking about issues like uh, setting up the data pipeline uh, and provide assistance in the deployment of the technology. Uh, now, um, law firms uh, who, are, uh, who, who, who are operating in this way, as I suggested, there are challenges. Uh, I'm not saying that these are insurmountable, uh, or that these are these are deal breakers, but they are they face a, a relative challenge on uh, recruitment, retention, uh, and motivation of non-lawyers. Uh, and the deployment of a multidisciplinary team requires coordination between uh, the lawyers and the non-lawyers. And so, to the extent that those non-lawyers are employed by the vendor, it requires coordination across organizational boundaries, and that's more challenging, I would suggest, in most cases, than coordination within an organizational boundary. Of course. There are examples where within an organizational boundary it may be challenging and where across organizational boundaries it may not be so challenging, but, but as a general proposition, um, we would suggest that um, uh, uh, across organizational boundaries uh, makes it more, more difficult to coordinate. So, so the footprint of the law firm, if we take this pipeline that we saw, the pieces that they're putting in are largely around the um, uh, taking the output and then using that to advise clients and providing the legal human capital for the training. Now, there may be uh, some project management as well uh, that's, go that's being supplied uh, by the law firm uh, and some uh, data science to assist in understanding the, uh, the, uh, the explanation. But the pieces around uh, setting up the data uh, pipeline in the first place and, and, and some other parts of this uh, non-legal expertise, they'll be outside the footprint of the law firm. They'll be, they'll be with the vendor. Uh, and certainly the design uh, uh, and the programming of the, uh, of the product will be uh, matters for the vendor. Now, um, if we move on to look at another uh, case study, a law company, um, this law company deploys AI and other technologies in providing legal operations support to law firms and corporate clients. The legal operations, that means they don't actually provide legal advice, they provide support, legal process support, for other organizations that actually give advice. Um, they, then, they also license technology platforms from vendors, but they, uh, they employ a wider range of non-legal human capital uh, necessary for the deployment uh, of, the, um, uh, of, the, um, uh, of the platform. Uh, and they assemble teams to work for particular clients uh, in, uh, 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 in which all the personnel are employed by uh, law company B. Now, within a corporate structure, um, they are able to raise outside capital and commit to invest in technology. So if at some point they decide that they wanted to acquire a particular piece of technology, they may acquire a vendor uh, and then take ownership of that technology as well. Uh, and the employees in the firm can be motivated by giving them equity uh, in, uh, in the company. And so the company's footprint looks something like this. So in contrast to the law firm, the company is not providing legal advice at the end. They're just providing support to their uh, clients who are themselves giving the legal advice. So their clients will be either law firms who are in this support to uh, give legal advice or large corporates where this will be an input to the in-house legal team uh, who will be providing the legal uh, uh, advice. Um, but what they do have uh, more of is more of these uh, uh, non-legal uh, or multidisciplinary roles uh, within the uh, corporate structure. Then, if we move on quickly to look at a, um, a corporate um, in-house team, um, this, this uh, is a company that deploys AI and other technologies in providing legal operations support 
uh, to their own in-house team. Uh, they license the uh, technology from, the, from a vendor, but they employ all the relevant non-legal human capital necessary for a deployment, uh, and they're all employed by the, uh, by the, uh, the company. Similarly to the law company, uh, they are able to recruit, retain, and motivate people within a corporate uh, structure using uh, stock in the firm as part of compensation, uh, using uh, a variety of different uh, corporate um, uh, promotion uh, pathways for technical and, 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 and legal uh, related people. Um, the, uh, the only differences from the, um, uh, the law company uh, when we look at the chart is that the legal team are also part of the mix. The legal team are also in here um, because the, the, uh, the corporate will, will own uh, or rather will employ uh, the, uh, the, the, the multidisciplinary uh, human capital necessary to make this process work, but they also uh, employ lawyers who will be ending up giving the advice to the organization about what they should do. Um, so the, both of these uh, corporate entities, uh, a law company and a corporate client, um, they're able to um, offer equity, offer a variety of different promotion structures uh, and management structures to uh, uh, set up and establish these multidisciplinary teams. Um, and so uh, they have more of the multidisciplinary personnel uh, than do uh, the law firm. Uh, the difference between the law company and the corporate uh, is over whether or not the uh, final legal advisory work uh, is within the organization or uh, is with a client. So I have a question uh, from Luca. Um, are you aware of any consortium of law firms or legal tech firms that pool individual law firm and data expertise? So this is a, uh, uh, this is a big uh, open issue in the sector. At present, what is seen generally is that uh, individual law firms or law companies are, um, are, are, are training uh, AI applications on their own data, or in the case of a law firm, substance uh, sometimes by reference to the data uh, from uh, their clients uh, or their, their, their client base. Um, what we are not seeing is any industry-wide uh, data pools. Um, and so that has two implications for adoption. Uh, one is that the uh, costs of entry are relatively high. The other is uh, because you have to have a sufficiently large pool of data to be able to make it worthwhile. The other is um, that uh, we're not seeing uh, the kind of uh, returns to scale that we might potentially see uh, because the size of the data pools uh, that are aggregated are, uh, uh, are not uh, industry-wide yet. There are moves afoot to deal with that and one of the things UKRI is trying to do uh, is uh, working uh, to uh, uh, seed uh, industry-wide um, uh, collaboration around uh, data pools. Uh, so that's very much uh, work in progress. So Václav, uh, general comment. Interestingly, some interviewees uh, in other teams streams of our research report that licensing costs for any high-end and successful technology often force them to hire people and develop things themselves. These people, uh, these firms argue that they'll prefer to buy uh, AI platforms to hiring people and reinventing the wheel. Um, and then uh, uh, Saad, um, in my experience of designing programs, the first uh, legal uh, tradition person who works with a tech person has to have a minimum programming knowledge uh, in this case, in-house team would be preferable. Um, so, uh, so these 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 two questions are, are really about the relationship between the platform here and the legal people involved in the platforms. So I'm not I'm not speaking about that. Uh, I'm not speaking about the um, uh, what we might call the make or buy question uh, with regard to the platform and the organisation over here, or uh, with regard to the relationship between the legal human capital and the technical capital within the uh, 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 organizational unit that actually develops the uh, platform in the first place. Um, so we've got, a, we've got a separate project that we're, a separate paper that we're starting work on where we'll look at the make or buy question uh, between the um, law tech company uh, or the, uh, uh, the firm that um, designs the uh, platform and the uh, user that scales its application. Uh, and well, then there's another project um, that uh, Richard and Mary uh, are involved in looking at the uh, law firm eco, uh, the, the law tech ecosystem, where we're looking at the relationships uh, between the participants in law tech startups, uh, and in particular their backgrounds and the, and, and the kind of human capital that goes into the mix. So these are great questions, but they're outside the scope of this paper. Okay, so the 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 the, uh, the, the hypothesis that we uh, that we take from 
uh, this interview data, this qualitative data, is that successful deployment of multidisciplinary teams is associated with use of corporate rather than partnership. Um, this is not an each and every case proposition. So we've seen plenty of case studies in our deploying AI. So it doesn't mean that you can't deploy AI if you're a part of it. Um, but what it means is the time we commence the um, the deployment of the technology. Uh, and then the second hypothesis that successful deployment of multidisciplinary teams is, is itself associated with the use of the corporate rather than the partnership for. So um, our survey, as I said, was um, we got 353 responses from solicitors uh, in private practice in England and Wales. Um, and the, um, the, 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 the vast majority of these were from people uh, working either in law firms uh, or in corporate in-house teams. So we can distinguish between these two. We can distinguish between someone working in a corporate, someone working uh, in a, a law firm, uh, and we'll use that as a variable of interest for organizational form. So um, first of all, um, the relationship between um, adoption of AI-based law tech. So uh, there's a question earlier about, well, how do we know it's really AI? Uh, well, we gave them, we give them a, a, a definition, as I said, of what we think AI is, but we also did a, um, we also did a separate question. Well, we asked them about the deployment of a range of other technologies, uh, so document management um, uh, 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 and things like that, that we would um, that we would uh, have been around for longer, and we would characterise as not being AI based. Uh, and so uh, that would be um, what, what we might call um, non AI law tech. Uh, and so when they uh, when they answered the questions about AI, they'd already answered the question about non AI law tech, and so. We were clearly uh, drawing a distinction there uh, between um, uh, technology of the kind that is used in uh, in office automation uh, from the uh, kinds of applications that we've been discussing in relation to AI. Um, so, just as at a univariate level, um, the um, uh, uh, 98 uh, respondents um, uh, indicated that they used any sort of AI law tech. Uh, so they were, they were able to answer yes to one or more of a range of different applications. Uh, and 132 uh, indicated that they didn't use any sort of AI-based law tech. Um, uh, uh, sorry, uh, I've, I'm, I've, I've not, uh, not got that right. So uh, it's 163 uh, respondents in total uh, indicated that they used uh, AI-based law tech of, of any kind, and 164 indicated that they did not. Uh, of those 163 who used any, any AI-based law tech, 65 uh, indicated that they worked on a day-to-day -day basis with persons other than lawyers, whereas uh, 98 indicated uh, that they only worked on a day-to-day -day basis uh, with other lawyers. Um, if we look at that question in relation to those who don't use AI-based law tech, uh, significantly fewer of them are working on a day-to-day -day basis with persons other than lawyers. Um, and so there looks to be a relationship there between a univariate relationship uh, between uh, uh, working in a multidisciplinary team, that is working on a day-to-day -day basis with persons other than lawyers, uh, and deployment of uh, or using uh, any AI-based law tech. That's consistent with our first hypothesis. We then look at the second hypothesis. What we've got here is the kinds of people that respondents work with on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, and what's interesting is if we look at the first two roles, other lawyers and paralegals, people working in law firms are more than people working in in-house departments, people working in corporate legal teams. So working with other lawyers is more common in a law firm. Whereas working with other types of uh, experts, so IT or legal innovation experts, legal project managers, data analysts, data scientists, process mapping experts, these are all more likely to be worked with by, on a day-to-day -day basis by lawyers working in-house than by lawyers working in law firms. Uh, and so uh, we would, we would we'd characterize it in, in a, a, a person who is working on a day-to-day -day basis 
with these uh, non-legal uh, uh, experts as someone who's working in a multidisciplinary team. So that's it. it's obviously it's a it's a proxy for capturing true multidisciplinary teams, but that's that's what we can take from our uh, survey data. And what we see is the difference between these is consistent with hypothesis two. So we see more day-to-day -day working with lawyers uh, in law firms than in corporate law departments, and more working with multidisciplinary, or more working with non-legal experts in those corporate departments than in the law firm. Uh, so that's our univariate um, analysis. Let's put this into a multivariate context. And so we, um, we this is survey data. This is the much that we can do variables so we uh, the survey is completely anonymous uh, so we didn't, we didn't ask people directly what their age was uh, uh, we uh, uh, try to minimize uh, personal data capture uh, so uh, but we can proxy this based on uh, the number of years since qualification so we ask people when they qualified uh, we um, uh, we can uh, we also uh, can, can control for the use of non AI law tech because that may well be correlated with the use of AI law tech that may provide a, a pathway to the implementation of other sorts of technology uh, and we can also uh, we also ask questions about training so we can ask people about what kind of training they received uh, in law tech in the previous or, or have they received training uh, in the previous three years again we'd expect that to be correlated with uh, deployment uh, of law tech and of AI related law tech so we can have some of those uh, some of those variables in there to control for the effects of these things uh, and let's take a look then at the multivariate uh, results. So the first table, uh, the dependent variable here is whether or not the respondent uses any AI-based law tech. So do they use any any type of AI-based law tech? Any of those use cases that we that, that we asked about and that I presented in the earlier slide. Um, and um, we've got here these control variables: years since qualification, number of non-AI law tech solutions used, have they had law tech training. Uh, uh, are they a partner, or a, uh, are they a partner, or, or if they're not working in a law firm, are they in a leadership role, uh, and do they aspire to a traditional legal career? These are other questions that we ask, and they turn out not to be significant in the results. Um, but what's interesting here is that there is a strong positive correlation uh, in all the specifications between uh, working in a multidisciplinary team, that is, working with non-lawyers on a day-to-day -day basis, and uh, use of AI-based law tech, which is consistent with our first hypothesis. So moving to the second hypothesis, we're looking here at the relationship between uh, multidiscipline, multidisciplinary teams and organizational type. Um, and uh, we've got two dependent variables here. So we have two uh, questions that we're getting at similar things, uh, and we can present uh, them, them as, as, as different dependent variables in this table. So the first three uh, specifications here, the first three models are logistic regressions, uh, and what we're uh, what we're using as dependent variable there is, does the respondent work on a day-to-day -day, uh, with people from other disciplines? Um, that is, uh, are they a, a member of a multidisciplinary team in the sense that we talked about? And then on these three models, um, we asked a different question. Uh, we said, do you agree or disagree that lawyers should be open to working with people from other disciplines? Uh, and um, the... Uh, 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 that that that's not do you actually work, but do you think it's a good idea for lawyers to work? Uh, and so, in a sense, this this gives us an element of robustness in the analysis about multidisciplinarity because we're capturing whether people actually work uh, and their feelings about it. Um, so that they're, they're two distinct uh, ways of thinking about the same issue of multidisciplinary teams. Uh, so the question here from Rahul: uh, Can you please expand on the data of sixty four? Uh, versus 98 supports your first hypothesis. I'll, I'll come back to that in a moment. Um, okay, so so in this uh, in this uh, uh, table, what we can see here is that the variable for law firm is negatively correlated, uh, and and the coefficients are statistically significant in all specifications. Are negatively correlated um, with both likelihood of working uh, with um, other disciplines on a day-to-day -day basis, and also with levels of agreement with the proposition that lawyers should be open to working with people from other disciplines. Um, what we see is that um, your likelihood of working with people from other disciplines and your level of agreement about that is positively correlated with your 
deployment of uh, law tech uh, solutions and so non-AI law tech solutions. Uh, and in this uh, model, in this in, in these models, uh, is positively correlated also with the uh, use of AI law tech, which we, we know already from the previous, uh, which we know we know about that relationship from the previous uh, table. Uh, and also, there's a, a correlation with uh, law tech training. Again, we saw that in the previous table. But just go back. Uh, uh, so, sorry, just to, just to finish on this one. This is consistent with our second hypothesis. This relationship is consistent with our second hypothesis. And so what, what can we take from this? Well, I want to be clear that we say that the results are consistent with hypothesis one and hypothesis two. That's as strong as we can get. This doesn't prove that, uh, uh, because what we've got here um, is a cross-section of data, uh, and we can't make any kind of causal claim uh, about these relationships. We can simply identify correlations. Um, uh, and many of these variables are likely to be uh, endogenously determined. That is, to, uh, the, the, the causation may run in one direction uh, or the other. Uh, and so we are eschewing making any causal claims based on our survey data. However, what we can say is that these correlations are at least consistent with the hypotheses uh, that we have um, that we have developed. So Rahul, I just want to go back to that earlier slide to um, respond to your question. So here, um, the, the point is that if you think about the proportion of people who are using AI law tech who are working in a multidisciplinary team, so 65 versus 98, uh, or 65 out of 163, that's much higher than 32 out of 163 of those who are not using AI law tech who are uh, working in a multidisciplinary team. And that difference is statistically significant in a univariate, um, uh, in a univariate test. Um, but obviously there are other things going on and that's why uh, we try to take some of those into account to see if that uh, relationship also comes up in a multivariate setting, which, uh, which we find that it does. Um, so Saad, were the survey distributed equally, lawyers, legal managers, otherwise it might affect the uh, figures that you mentioned. So uh, everybody who everybody who received the survey was a practicing solicitor. Uh, so th that's because we distributed it through uh, the law society in Wales. So uh, basically, they have a, a register of, of all persons who are, uh, are qualified, to, uh, and we ask them to send the survey out uh, to ten thousand uh, people on their register, uh, selected at random. Uh, now. Uh, that, um, uh, the, that way we didn't have to see the list of members. We didn't have to see the data as to who uh, was in fact uh, a member of the Law Society, uh, who is or rather who is in fact a practicing solicitor. Um, and that allowed the survey to be completely anonymous from our point of view. We set it up on a platform called Qualtrics and they just answered the survey question um, uh, anonymously. Um, it's not uh, a representative uh, it's not fully random because the response rate, uh, we were concerned about the low response rate. Uh, and so uh, we, uh, we, we subsequently, uh, um, a, a further uh, batch of lawyers uh, uh, to uh, try and increase the response rate. We didn't really increase the response rate very much. Um, so it's not, um, it's, not, um, it's not randomly distributed. However, we, um, uh, we think it can tell us useful insights about the uh, relationship between the organizations, the organizational type in which people work and the nature of the uh, other personnel with whom uh, uh, respondents work. Um, and we can compare at least uh, those working in law firms and those working in corporates because we've got a significant, the vast majority of the respondents are, are falling into one of those two categories. Um, Okay, so um, so what? What are we to make of all this? What are the implications for the law firms? The evidence suggests that uh, traditional partnership-based law firms or, or, or partnerships which are only lawyers uh, may be uh, firms that are organized as companies. So what? Uh, what are the implications of this for the law firms? Well, clients may find it cheaper to uh, do their own AI-based law tech analysis or to purchase from a legal operations company, that is a, a company that specializes in providing this kind of service, uh, like Law Company B. Uh, and that may mean that the, the work that uh, a law firm, the law firm tries to do this work in-house, the client may say, well, no, we don't want to pay you to do it. Uh, we would rather have that work done by another organization, and then you can, uh, you can tell us about the results if you like, uh, but we don't want you 
you to be uh, doing this uh, this, uh, um, this automated piece. Um, so if there are cost advantages to uh, having a, 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 a using corporate form uh, for uh, multidisciplinary teams, then we might expect that to put pressure uh, on law firms. Um, again, this is not going to be good, uh, embedded in the law firm uh, may uh, uh, be better than having it uh, in a, 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 an outside organization. Uh, and we're, as I said, we're going to be exploring that in a subsequent paper where we look at the, uh, the contracting questions between um, uh, the law firm uh, and the, uh, the outside organizations, the make or buy question. Um, but uh, the, uh, uh, the, imp the implication would be, though, that we, we would expect uh, market share uh, to grow for firms that are organizing themselves as companies providing this kind of automated work. However, um, that doesn't mean that law firms um, uh, don't have options available. To them. Um, so one option uh, that we've seen a number of firms have done is to establish a subsidiary, a corporate subsidiary, uh, which then runs the, uh, uh, the operational parts of this pipeline. Um, and, and the employees can be given stock in the subsidiary uh, to help uh, motivate them. Uh, and they can have a management structure of a corporate form uh, in order to um, uh, uh, help uh, organize a multidisciplinary team. Um, law firms uh, either establish these subsidiaries or, in some cases, acquire uh, 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 subsidiaries in this. Uh, and the partnership itself becomes a subsidiary of a corporate. Uh, and so uh, law firm D has made use of the new uh, ABS, Alternative Business Structure, rules that were introduced by the Legal Services Act 2007 to do an initial public offering. Uh, and what it did was it changed its structure such that there's a parent company, which is now a PLC, which has raised capital uh, from public markets, and the law firm is now a partnership, but a subsidiary of the corporate. Uh, and so the way that works is that the majority partner is the corporate, and the other law firm partners are now minority partners. Um, so this organization um, has the tech work and the multidisciplinary teams working in the parent company at the corporate level at the parent company uh, and the um, uh, law firm uh, uh, advisory work being done in the partnership subsidiary. So this ends up being very, very similar to the uh, kind of organizational footprint that we saw in the corporate client. Uh, so within the organization, uh, there is and the legal advisory uh, human capital, which is now in the uh, law firm partnership subsidiary. Um, and so uh, what we would expect is that um, we'd see uh, increasing experimentation by law firms that uh, want to uh, deploy this kind of technology in-house. Uh, we would see increasing experimentation with subsidiaries uh, and or with alternative business structures of this kind. Uh, and somebody, um, one of our interviews from this firm commented as follows. So we've got the ability to attract not just technology experts, but also kind of legal, quasi-legal, hybrid data kind of people. You know, come join us, a sexy arm's length research and development innovation company is a better sell in our industry, that is the legal industry, and come and join our IT function. Uh, so again, they emphasize the recruitment and retention benefits uh, of having uh, this different organizational structure. What about the legal profession? What might the implications be for the legal profession? Um, well, our evidence suggests that legal human capital augments the development and deployment of AI-based law tech. Um, so these are the new roles that we saw, um, uh, um, uh, you know, the roles uh, um, uh, that come with the technology and the roles for legal human capital in designing law tech and in uh, training uh, law tech models uh, to be applied uh, then by traditional, uh, 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 traditional legal advisory work. Um, but these, these roles for uh, legal human capital, these don't look like traditional lawyering uh, in a sense that we uh, would previously have understood. And in many cases, is happening outside of organizations that characterize themselves as law firms. So this raises, we think, an open question for the future of the profession. Uh, will uh, such professionals uh, using legal human capital in this way uh, continue to be seen as lawyers? Uh, will they develop some kind of hybrid uh, professional identity of their own? Uh, lawyer technologists or lawyer data scientists? Where will the boundary of the legal profession be? 
Uh, will the legal profession include these people with legal human capital, or will there be some kind of breakout which might then incorporate some of the other uh, members of these multidisciplinary teams who are specialized in the domain uh, of legal services? Uh, we don't answer that question, but we simply raise it as a question uh, that is going to need to be uh, explored uh, from uh, an ethical and organizational point of view at the level of the profession. So uh, to conclude the um, uh, main points of the talk, we assert that AI uh, mainly, mainly augments legal skills rather than substitutes for them. Um, so it augments traditional legal advisory work, but also there are new roles uh, in these multidisciplinary teams uh, that augment the technology. Um, the deployment of AI in, uh, uh, pipelines requires multidisciplinary teams. Um, we think the organizational form is a relevant factor in setting up um, these multidisciplinary teams. Traditional law firm partnerships uh, may face a disadvantage in doing this. Um, we see the entry of uh, the so-called law companies uh, and the restructuring of some law firms as alternative business structures. The legal human capital um, uh, deployed in these uh, multidisciplinary teams uh, in, in the non-advisory context, um, as I said, raises issues about the boundaries of the legal profession. So I, I'm stopping the, the talk there. Um, just to uh, give you uh, some cues for further information, if you're interested, uh, Mari Sarko and I have written a theory paper, um, which uh, informs some of the analysis in this paper, uh, which is um, published in the, just been published in the Journal of Professionals and Organization. Uh, there's a link uh, there. Uh, and then the survey report um, that I was talking about, we have a report uh, on our survey which contains descriptive stats, but not multivariate analysis. Uh, that's available um, on our project webpage uh, on the law faculty, uh, on the law faculty um, uh, website. Uh, and there have been, we've had updates about the project on our project website and the Oxford Business Law blog and everything's tweeted um, at the handle AI for law. Um, okay, so some questions. Um, Horst, is there data analysis on the effects of AI applications on the productivity with which certain tasks can be completed or the profitability of law firms in general? No. Uh, so there's internal, there's internal analysis on productivity, uh, but we haven't seen any of that internal analysis. That's the kind of data that is, um, uh, so the, the interviews are not, uh, the organizations are not willing to share with us. We infer from the uh, deployment uh, that productivity has increased substantially. Uh, we've heard anecdotal evidence that productivity may increase uh, in hundreds of percent uh, uh, in, in, uh, in some of the contexts where it has been employed, uh, but we don't have any kind of um, uh, robust uh, um, uh, non-anecdotal account of that. Uh, and, in, and in particular, the profitability of law firms, data on the profitability of law firms is quite hard to come by uh, because um, the majority of law firms do not report uh, any um, uh, any accounting data. Uh, Domenico, to what extent is this tech-driven revolution in law firms understood by clients' companies in research on what marketing techniques are being used by them to communicate to the market that this uh, revolution has started? Um, so, uh, yes, I mean the clients. The, th the thing the thing that's really interesting is that organisations like Law Company B they are selling uh, their services basically to law firms and to clients. Um, and so clients are thinking on the one hand about the work that they are asking law firms to do, but they're also thinking, should we be uh, buying these services from uh, a law company that's more focused on the technical uh, side of things, or should we actually be asking our own technical people to do this uh, and then just pass the results on to the law firm uh, for advisory? And so Clients themselves are going through, uh, uh, this, this is just one part of a more general digital revolution uh, that clients are going through. So many of these corporate clients are thinking about the way in which they uh, gather data, the way in which they manage their data, and how they can best uh, organize that to uh, most efficiently deploy technical solutions across a whole range of different business activities, of which legal is one. Uh, and so as part of that exercise, they are reflecting on uh, the deployment of technology. Uh, and um, uh, and then uh, they are uh, that they are then approaching the law firms and saying, well, what are you doing uh, about technology? And so there's there's some some interviewees have, have taken the view that actually a lot of what the law firms are doing um, is relatively marginal still at this stage, uh, and that uh, and that in some senses in some cases it's motivated by a desire to to be seen to be doing something 
uh, rather than by uh, actual productivity gains. Uh, Johannes, if things go wrong, how does developing and employing AI tools affect professional liability of law firms, especially considering MBT and ABS? So um, basically, if you, uh, if you give the legal advice, uh, then uh, you are liable if there's any negligence in the, um, uh, uh, in the, in, in the uh, uh, forming of the opinion that you have passed on. So uh, we can draw from a legal point of view, we can draw a distinction between those contexts in which the organization is bundling together both the analysis and the advice uh, and those where the organization is just doing the analysis. So law firm A is giving advice and where work is done in-house, the advice is given on, on the back of that. So in, law, in, in company B, law company B, sorry, in company C, law company B, um, they're just doing the uh, analytics and then passing the results on to somebody else who does the advice. So if you are um, gonna be giving advice on the basis of this, you want to be sure um, about the robustness of uh, what it is that you're advising on. And you want to be sure uh, that the um, a platform and the, and, the, and the technique that's being deployed is one that um, is well understood in terms of uh, what the uh, sensitivities are uh, to uh, the data that's gone into it uh, and what the uh, weaknesses might be um, in the uh, in the results. And so th this is a, obviously a, a creates a, a conservatism uh, in uh, adoption. Um, but uh, where we are seeing the uh, where we're seeing uh, 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 the AI being um, adopted, there's been uh, there's, there's already been plenty of work done uh, on cross-checking uh, these sorts of things, um, and so the organisations that are deploying it uh, feel, notwithstanding uh, the conservatism uh, or notwithstanding these concerns about uh, potential liability, that they understand well uh, the uh, as it were, the, the quality of the output and, and that they can interpret that effectively. So they've done an awful lot of, uh, of, of prior testing, uh, of, um, of, of internal comparisons against the results from uh, human analysis uh, before they put the system live. Um, and that's the other point to mention, is that when we're talking about vast quantities of data, humans don't do that great a job, actually. Uh, and so, um, you know, even if the system, the system may have certain uh, the system may have certain uh, weak spots, uh, but humans too have weak spots. And so the question is not uh, what's the absolute uh, level of accuracy that the system uh, delivers. Rather, the question is, if you're going to deploy it, what's its relative accuracy compared to a human benchmark? Uh, and also uh, compared to the benchmark of somebody who is deploying the system with reasonable care. Uh, and so if you're taking reasonable care and you're achieving better results than a human would, it's hard to see how uh, you would face liability uh, for uh, mistakes in the, in the, uh, in the system. Uh, Joshua Getzer, is legal AI capability being cultivated offshore in lower cost regions, e.g. India, so that we can accept a stripping out of volume and value of Western law firm businesses? And will the offshore units end up displacing the metropole firms entirely? So um, what we're seeing is um, that the uh, law tech startups are very much concentrated um, in the uh, 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 in the big uh, metropolitan centers where um, the law firms themselves are based. So um, we're seeing a lot, of, um, a lot of law tech startups in London, a lot in uh, New York, uh, and a lot in San Francisco. Uh, and so, uh, as I said, one of, our, one of our other projects is looking at uh, the law tech ecosystem and trying to study in the aggregate uh, the... Um, uh, the pattern of, uh, uh, of, of, of inception uh, and, and scaling up of, um, uh, of law tech firms. Um, so that's it's, it's outside the scope of, the, of this particular paper. So I'm not getting any more questions. Um, does that mean we're out of time? No. Um, so there's time, for, there's time for more questions. Yeah, anyone? We have seven, seven minutes. The model that of technology that you have used uh, all along the uh, presentation was of a decision maker who delegate a task to a machine 
uh, the machine can scale up the task relative to the decision maker, can do it faster, can do it on a, can use more data, but the decision maker is in control all the time. And it seems to me that the, the, the whole point about artificial intelligence is that it blurs the, the distinction between decision making and, uh, and a delegated task. So, for example, if we think about a pilot and an automatic pilot, traditionally some tasks were delegated to the automatic pilot, but the pilot was all the, all the time in control. Now, what happened in the, in the 737 MAX is that the machine started doing things that were not delegated by the decision maker. And worse, the decision maker was not even aware of the fact that the machine was doing stuff. And it seems to me that this is where AI is different than the old models of, of technology. And as a result, people should be very, very worried about it. So, I mean, you talked about a decision maker who gives a thousand documents to a machine to be analyzed. At the end, the aggregation, no one understands why exactly the machine has given up a certain recommendation and still the decision maker is liable. And as you have said uh, 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 and emphasized in the presentation, the problem is going to be even worse if the task is outsourced. So what did you find in your research? Did you find a lot of worrying about that? Did you find that, how do lawyers think about this problem that seems to me like, like a major concern? It, Boeing may not, may not, may never recover from the 737 max. I mean, this is something that can have, let, let alone the 500 people who died in the two accidents. So what did you find in the field in, among the people that you talked to? So, I mean, I, 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 um, I'll just expand on the answer that I gave to Johannes. So first of all, I mean, there's a, there's a semantic issue, I guess, here about what is AI. Um, and you know, delegation versus initiating a decision is that the boundary of AI? And we're not we're not placing that you know we're not we're not sort of using that as a as a categorization for seeing what is or isn't AI. So our definition of AI is what you might call a fairly um, modest definition. Um, we're looking at examples of a um, uh, 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 very very specific. Uh, uh, applications of AI, the definition of AI that we're using is, is it doing, is it uh, automating a task for which humans would ordinarily use their brain? Um, and you might say, well, that's a very low level of definition. No, uh, that's not what I thought AI was. Uh, in which case we'd talk about it as, you know, as, 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 as technology X or, or something like that, because that's what we're talking about. So given that, in all these contexts where we are, um, where we're seeing it applied, some human is making a strategic decision about the deployment. So somebody is saying, yes, it's okay for us to use AI in this context. It's okay for us to use this system. Second point is once we've made that decision within the application, you're absolutely right. We don't know. Nobody knows uh, what it is that the system is picking up. That's uh, you know, there's all sorts of uh, all sorts of relationships in the data, you know, second and third order inter interaction effects and so forth. But, that you know, are, are impossible to interpret uh, ordinarily. Um, uh, and so does that mean then that uh, we should be afraid of the, of the results? Well, the, the thing that um, the thing I, I, I meant, made, and I, perhaps I didn't do a very good job of, of this, but the thing that, um, that really helps, I think, in deployment is having a benchmark. Uh, so if you can benchmark the results uh, and you can say, look, our results are better than they would be if we employed humans, uh, then the question, um, as Horst has argued in other work, the question then rapidly becomes, well, you're negligent if you don't use the system. Um, because if you rely on the humans who make mistakes, you know, the humans are up all night, they're going to drink so much coffee, they're searching through this data, they miss stuff. Um, and there's been quite a lot of work done, um, both uh, some academic work, and quite a lot of in-house uh, testing work done to compare the results with the uh, results of, of, of humans. Um, and so if you find that they're better than humans, then um, my suggestion will be you, you don't need to worry so much about liability. Uh, and this has actually been supported by K 
case law in the US. So in the, the context where there's been the furthest penetration has been e-discovery. Uh, so e-discovery is 70% you know, of litigation costs in the US are eaten up by discovery because it, you know, in, a, in a typical large lawsuit, if you stacked all the paper documents, if you put everything in paper and stacked it all on top of each other, it would reach up to the moon. That's the, that's the size of the, of, the data, uh, of the data problem. And so if you have humans working through that, um, there's gonna be lots and lots of mistakes. And so uh, the, uh, the, the, um, uh, the, um, uh, it was in the Southern District of New York, the, the judge, a judge in 2015 uh, was asked about whether or not it was legitimate for um, uh, e-discovery to be used in the context of a trial, given that there were certain imperfections in the process. And the judge then um, said, well, look, the uh, party using it has done a study where they've benchmarked this against the performance of humans, and it's got a better result than the humans. And therefore, the, the, there is no question that they're allowed to use it. Um, and you know, someday we may say that they, in fact, may be required to use it. We haven't got to saying that they're required to use it yet, but certainly they're allowed to use it where the performance exceeds human performance. Um, now, having said that, um, you may exceed human performance, but there may be predictable errors as well. Uh, and so a lot of the state of the art work that's being done is looking at the robustness of the results to so-called adversarial examples, uh, which is where you, uh, you find a, a system that somebody's designed something to try and uh, con the system, to try and fool the system. Um, that's less of an issue in the context of e-discovery because everything is, uh, not, nothing's endogenous. It's all, it's all, all, all the stuff has all happened before the system is applied and people haven't been thinking about litigation usually when they've been sending their emails in, in the corporate context. But in the context, say, of, a, of, of contract analytics, um, what we would expect to see is people starting to draft these clauses in ways that don't use the standard words to try and spoof the system. Um, and we've, we've had conversations with uh, uh, law tech startups where they've said that this is actually exactly what they've seen happening. Um, and so part of the, uh, the sort of cutting edge of research in computer science is about how to, um, how, you know, wh what are the properties uh, of, a, of a system that make it robust against adversarial examples? And how do you benchmark about robustness to adversarial examples? And that's much more complicated than simply benchmarking accuracy um, uh, or, or um, uh, you know, the, 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 the standard, standard benchmarks of, of, of um, a recall that are used uh, uh, in, uh, in data extraction. So, um, so that there's a lot of work going on um, at the technical frontiers on that. Um, but I would say the legal position at the moment is if it's better than human performance and uh, you are taking uh, all care that's necessary, uh, then I don't think uh, there's a great, uh, sorry, you're taking all care that, 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 that a reasonable user will be taking care. Then I, I don't think that one, uh, uh, that, that a, a firm would be uh, worried greatly about uh, liability risk. Um, I have to say this, this particular question is not, not our paper. This is a, uh, you know, something Horst, Horst has written about this, uh, but that's, that's the perception that we got from uh, people uh, in the sector when we spoke to them. Um, so there will certainly be unexpected uh, surprises that will come up. But the point is that, you know, humans, humans are not so great uh, at this kind of data extraction job either. Um, and so, um, uh, you know, it, and once we understand what those, what those problems might be that, that, that come up, we can start to control for them, we can start to take them into account. Um, and I, yeah, I, I don't know, you know, to what extent this, uh, you know, with the seven, the, the problem, the problem, the problems with these sorts of systems arise where you cannot, uh, where there isn't the opportunity to benchmark. Uh, so if you if you try to use it in a context where you know where, 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 where there's no obvious benchmark, that's when I think you're really uh, really flying blind. Um, so I've got I've got some other questions here. Um, so Rahul, the traditional pushback against the use of AI in the law is that it will render lawyers jobless. Your research suggests that it may actually enhance professional avenues for lawyers. I completely agree with that, um, and I think that the uh, uh, um, uh, the the the, the, um, the you know. What, what may happen is that there will be, and what we, I think anecdotally we're starting to see is that there'll be fewer associate level positions in large law firms. Um, but actually what a lot of associates used to do, certainly when I left law school, what a lot of associates used to do was pretty menial stuff like photocopying and proofreading. Um, they'd stay up all night proofreading documents before a transaction closed. And that's pretty menial stuff. And you know, one didn't do uh, however many years of law school in order to end up doing that. Uh, and levels of job satisfaction were very low. Um, so, so some of those humans who were involved in doing that work, they won't be needed anymore. But those who are recruited actually will end up doing uh, 
a much more interesting uh, kind of work because the stuff that everybody hated doing uh, will now be uh, will now be automated. Uh, Luca, would you like to take the next question, or shall I say that? No. So Murray, Murray Cox. Uh, there's also a degree to which risk can be assumed by clients in the sense that firms simply say that the service they're offering is to report on the results of an analysis performed by a particular AI without assuming responsibility for the reliability of the AI. Regulators will need to support that kind of liability exclusion. So Murray, um, uh, Murray is a partner at Slaughter and May, uh, and so uh, he speaks uh, more authoritatively on this point than I do, obviously. Uh, and, but that's you know that's another uh, that's another strategy that can be used uh, to uh, to manage the liability question. Um, so um, uh, Richard and Murray, I don't know if you wanted to come in on any of those uh, any of those questions um, to elaborate on anything that I've said. Just on that final point, I understand that the SRA uh, requires law firms to, to take responsibility for all aspects of their advice. So essentially, they take the, the legal risks involved. And also on the law tech side from separate conversations, they actively try to exclude all liabilities. So it's basically the law firms uh, taking the hit on that. So, so if there are no other um, questions or answers. I would like just to, to note that um, if you want to um, receive the slides, you should uh, ask uh, John for them. Uh, and um, it's uh, five, minute up, uh, five minutes after uh, two, and uh, it, was, it was an excellent seminar for which we all have to thank John. We, we usually would uh, clap our hands and uh, I will do that uh, uh, virtually on the behalf of everyone. Thank you very much, John. And see you all hopefully uh, next week. Uh, we have uh, Horst or Joshua, I can't remember right now, but uh, uh, yeah, Horst uh, together with uh, Jens Damman on co-determination in the US. So see you then and thank you all for taking part in this lively seminar. Thanks everyone for your questions, really appreciate it.